Good afternoon from Philadelphia. I'm Dr. Romel Rivera, the president of the Association of Philippine Physicians in America, APPA or APA, and I will be your MC today. To our viewers here in the United States, the Philippines and the world, this is series number 10 of the Philam Health Forum on COVID-19. The Philam Health Forum was organized to build community and to give you the most updated information so you can make informed decisions regarding your health and safety. The Health Forum also aims to address health disparities in the Philam community. And as we keep repeating, an informed community is an empowered community. As in previous series, we have invited Filipino-American health experts. And today, we have another Filipino-American health expert. He is Dr. Patricio Reyes, a neurologist and neuropathologist, who will be sharing with us the most up-to-date information on COVID-19 and the nervous system. He will be introduced and will be speaking shortly. At this time, let me mention my co-organizers, the Philam Health Forum on COVID-19. Number one, Dr. Marie Ortaliz is the president of PNA New York. Number two, um, Dr. Emerson Ia, the chairperson for Kalusugan Coalition, also based in New York. And Dr. Laura Garcia, the chair for the National Federation of Philippine American Associations in New York. We have today representatives of the Council for Young Philippine Americans in Medicine, um, a, a committee of APPA, their medical students, Francine Castillo and Kate Galvan. At this time, I'm privileged and honored to introduce to you the Philippine Consul General in New York, Ambassador Claro Cristobal. Ambassador Cristobal, together with Consul Armand Talbo and the consulate staff, have been our partners in the Health Forum. And we thank you, Ambassador, for hosting us on your Zoom account today. So, Ambassador Cristobal. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rivera. Uh, I'll be very quick uh, today. I just wish to reiterate how pleased we are at the consulate that our partners uh, among the uh, Filipino American physicians, nurses, uh, as well as uh, NAFA have continued uh, with this very laudable project. Uh, I cannot agree more with what uh, you said uh, Dr. Rivera, that an informed community is an empowered community. And we continue to be blessed uh, by the great knowledge as well as uh, advice that we receive from our panelists. And I expect today to be uh, no different. Uh, we expect great uh, advice and information from uh, Dr. Reyes. So thank you so much uh, uh, to you all, the co-organizers of this forum. And uh, we do look forward to a very, very fruitful discussion on uh, the, the uh, neurological uh, issues of uh, COVID-19. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. At this time, I'll call on Mar Dr. Marie Ortaliz for medical disclaimers and housekeeping rules uh, before we go to the uh, formal presentation. Dr. Marie. Thank you, Dr. Rivera. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Marie Ortaliz. I will be reviewing some housekeeping rules for our webinar today. This event is being recorded so that it can be shared and posted later. Please keep your microphone and video camera muted when not speaking and please silence your cell phone. If you have questions for our speaker, Dr. Patricia Reyes, after the initial presentation, please enter them in the chat box. 
For those viewing us at the Philippine Consulate Facebook page, you may also message your question on the live stream. My co-organizers will be monitoring the chat box for questions and comments. Our goal for this series is to build community and share information. If you or your loved one is having a specific medical concern, please seek attention from your healthcare provider. This is an evolving phenomenon and every locality situation is different. Please refer to cdc.gov or coronavirus.gov and your local public health department for the most up-to-date information. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. And now we have Dr. Laura Garcia to introduce our speaker. Laura. Thank you, Dr. Romel. It is my honor to introduce Dr. Pat Reyes. Dr. Reyes, a graduate of the University of the Philippines College of Medicine, class of 1971, is a board certified neurologist and neuropathologist and chief of neurology and director of traumatic brain injury, Alzheimer's disease and cognitive disorders at the Carl T. Hayden VA healthcare system in Phoenix, Arizona. Prior to coming to Arizona, he was professor of neurology, Bernard Alpers professor and director of neuropathology, Alzheimer's disease and dementia center and brain bank at Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. While at Jefferson, he was a member of the NIH Institute on Aging's Ad Hoc Committee on Alzheimer's Disease and Research Centers, which created and funded various centers in the country. He was also professor of neurology, pathology, and psychiatry at Creighton University School of Medicine. And Carson Sonheim, Sonheim, Solheim Chair of Alzheimer's Disease and Cognitive Disorders at Barrow Neurological Institute. He is an advisory board member of Brain Injury Alliance of Arizona, Chief Medical Officer of the retired NFL Players Association, board member emeritus of the Association of Ringside Physicians, and participant of the Department of Defense Blast Injury Research Program. He considers himself very fortunate to be given the opportunity to serve our veterans by offering them timely and increased access to high quality neurological care, as well as the privilege of helping understand better the underpinnings of their neurological symptoms. Recently, he was appointed guest editor of Frontiers of Neurology, the fifth leading neurology journal in the world on the acute and chronic clinical and neuropathological aspects of COVID-19 on the central and peripheral nervous system. The, and chief technology officer of Halbert Corporation, which aims to develop new diagnostic and treatment modalities for COVID-19. He hopes to help raise the world's awareness and knowledge on COVID-19 related neurological disorders. I am proud to present Dr. Pat Reyes. Welcome everybody to our uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, lecture uh, series. And I would like to thank, of course, the organizers of this conference and also the staff and the Consul General of um, the Philippine Embassy, New York. So welcome everybody. And it's an honor to be here. Uh, today, I will share with you some of the most recent concepts on how the nervous system is involved in COVID-19. And this is how I looked before we opened up businesses in Arizona after two months of lockdown. So in the beginning, uh, when we listed the common symptoms of COVID-19, we didn't realize that some of the symptoms were actually related to brain function. You look at the loss, loss of appetite, the loss of smell, which we will talk in de more detail later on, muscle aches and muscle pain. These are governed by the nervous system. 
Second, as we learn more about this disease, we now know that many of our patients complain of headaches, which are again neurologic, and brain fog, their thinking process is not good. But uh, they don't realize that this is now, could be rather the beginning of involvement of the nervous system. So, but before I proceed, let me just give you a brief overview of what a virus is. A virus is an obligate intracellular parasite. That means that the virus cannot replicate by themselves. They have to infect a cell, get into the cell, use the machinery of the cell to reproduce itself and kill the cell. And these viruses are, are named after their structure, their chemistry, size, shape, and host. Now, tonight or today, we will discuss mostly coronavirus. It belongs to a large family of viruses that usually are found among animals. And they're called zoonotic viruses. For many decades, we didn't realize that we are actually being infected by coronaviruses. And you know why? Because the first four strains of coronavirus actually cause common cold. So I think all of us have had common cold. So some of those colds are due to coronavirus, but they were mild. The last two decades, we have witnessed three coronaviruses that have caused severe lung infections and fatality. The first one occurred in Foshan, China in 2002 that caused severe lung problems and even death. This was followed a decade later, later in the Middle East, mostly in Saudi Arabia, in 2012 and 2014. And this virus came from a camel. Now we're battling the pandemic of COVID-19, which is due to SARS coronavirus 2. And I'll show you why we believe it came from bats. As a neuropathologist also, I, we tried to identify this virus under electron microscope. And you can see here the dots on the surface of this virus. And if you draw it here below, it looks like a crown. And that's why it's called corona. And on the surface of the virus are these spikes with a valve at the end. And these are called the spikes of coronavirus. And this contains the most virulent and contagious part of the virus. So when this uh, breaks up, then the, the virus particle just goes haywire and infects more cells, all right? And now <clears throat> with molecular technology, we're able to identify and characterize this type of virus. Now, we also know now that this virus goes into a cell, whether it's the lung cell or the brain cell, and attaches to a receptor, and that uses that receptor in going into the cell. All right, and we'll discuss this later on. Now, how does the virus enter the body? by blood, by oral uh, uh, mechanism, by inhalation, by body orifice, by skin. Or this one is very dear to me because I work very hard on proving that olfactory system, the sense of the smell, the nerve that allows us to smell is pretty much involved in many neurological disorders. Now, what are the roots of entry uh, used by the virus into the brain. There are three main uh, 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 pathways, and that is through the nerve, 
The nose is has a nerve called the olfactory nerve that allows us to smell, but it is connected into the brain. It's through the bloodstream. Virus can circulate in the blood and go into the brain or the nervous system. And also when the lungs fail or is, and the lungs are not able to deliver sufficient amount of oxygen to the brain, the brain and other parts of the nervous system that have and I'll show that to you. Let me just point out a unique feature of the brain that's different from the rest of the human body. This is the blood flowing into our blood vessels. And this is, these are called the endothelial cells that line up the small blood vessels in the brain. This is the only blood vessel in the human body where there is no, there, where the connections are so tight you can, they cannot enter the brain through this. So it's called the tight junction. And this is important because the nerve cells here above are protected by this, what we call the blood-brain barrier. So the virus normally cannot enter the brain. Now, this is how the brain works. The brain is made up of billions of cells and they're interconnected. It's like a network, computer system. And if one brain cell dies, some of the cells connected with that dying cell or dead cell will also degenerate. And that's what you call transsynaptic degeneration. It's that concept is very important in understanding how symptoms from brain damage, from nerve damage occur many years down the road. So let's look at the different pathways by which the virus enters the brain through the blood circulation. But the, the, the initial event that happened is through the immune system. Because the immune system is the vanguard uh, and has the uh, 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 responsibility and of protecting us from invading organisms, including cancer cells. There is also uh, a problem when the lungs are no longer able to deliver enough oxygen into the brain, and we call it hypoxic injury. And the last thing is, is this is what is dear to me because I prove that the olfactory system is a root of infection into the brain. Now, this is the immune system to your right, and uh, we are blessed in a very active immune system. So any offending organism and even cancer cells, they're attacked by this immune cells. So they're all over our body, the tonsils, the adenoids, the thymus gland, the lymph nodes, and parts of the intestine, and even the bone marrow, then the spleen. This, ladies and gentlemen, are the cells are the organs of the immune system. Now, as uh, because I now uh, work with uh, the veterans and the military and the Department of Defense, I try to uh, sort of use the military as a, as a, uh, a uh, as a model for this infection. When the virus enters the body, the cells of the immune system uh, are activated. The first one are the macrophages. I call this the marines. The marines are the ones that say, wait a minute, you cannot come in, I'm here. But on the other hand, when the invading organisms are large in number, they will call other cells. So the macrophages will call on B cells, which may be the Navy, and the helper T cells, which could be the Air Force to help them cope with invasion. So the B cells are very important because they produce the antibodies that will protect us from the virus during the invasion or the infection, and even later on to protect us from further infection. The helper T cells will help coordinate the immune system and recruit more cells to fight the virus. 
And this is an interesting group of immune cells, the memory cells. These are the cells who recognize the virus, and when there is reinfection or surge, the memory cells are ready to attack the same virus. All right? So the good thing is this inflammatory, this uh, immune cells produce chemicals or proteins that will promote more inf uh, in inflammation and recruit more immune cells. And these are some, they're called cytokines and chemokines. And these are some of the cell, uh, the, the proteins and the, um, and the substances that are uh, uh, produced by the immune cells that are activated. However, when the immune system is on an overdrive, meaning there is an overproduction of immune cells and the substances called cytokines and chemokines, it can all, they can also have a deleterious effect on different organs. There, there may be high fever, swelling, redness, extreme fatigue, nausea, confusion, and failure of different organs like the heart, the brain, the kidney, and the liver may fail. And there is a high, very high percentage of mortality when this occurs. This is called the cytokine storm. Now, uh, in early March, I got a call from my uh, friends from London asking me when there was so many deaths in around the world about this, what can, what do you think we can do to prevent uh, deaths or lessen the uh, deaths in patients with this symptom. I said, when you, the patient has the cytokine storm, there are only two ways that the patient can go. One is they're gonna die. Second, give them the best thing that you have in your armamentarium and give them steroids. And true enough, now I have, because we are writing a book on this, uh, steroids have helped many patients recover from cytokine storm. And I wish we were able to do that in the Philippines right away. So uh, this has saved a lot of patients now, but we need to know when to give it, how much and what to give and how long. Now, what are other pathways? So that is the circulation and the immune system. How about when the lungs fail? What happens to the brain when the lungs are no longer able to deliver enough oxygen to the brain? This is what happens. You see here, you have a normal lung. It's like pink, pinkish. And this is the heart in between the two lungs. The lungs are very soft. You can squeeze it because it has expand and constrict uh, 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 when we breathe. When there is pneumonia or infection like COVID-19, the lungs solidify. They can no longer uh, uh, expand. And so what happens? The color changes, it is solid. And below that, the heart, if you notice, the heart has become bigger, much bigger. And so that is why some of the patients with COVID-19 develop heart failure. Now, if you take a piece of this lung and look at the microscope of this uh, uh, piece of lung, you see inflammation. Tremendous amount of inflammation, dead tissue, swelling, and blood. So there's no chance for this lung to recover. And some of my patients have now undergone bilateral lung transplantation, and they have done well. Now, if you look at, again, as a pathologist, uh, I have to look at this under the microscope as well. 
As a neurologist, I had to diagnose them and treat them. As a pathologist, we try to study the brain. And the brain in these patients are swollen. Look at this. This is a very swollen brain. If you look at this under the microscope, a piece of this, this is the normal brain. And look at the other side, the right side, they're holes. These are all fluid. And so there is tremendous swelling and there are no more brain cells left. The last uh, uh, pathway is something that's very dear to me. Because in 1993, we were the first to describe that the olfactory nerve that allows us to smell that's located in the nose here uh, is damaged in Alzheimer's disease. And I found this out by accident when I saw a patient who was always eating a snicker bar every time she tried to, she saw me in the clinic. And I had no idea that the smell is related to taste. And I then began, we at the University of Pennsylvania where I did the study, we found out that all patients with Alzheimer's disease could not smell right. They have olfactory deficit or smell problem. And I didn't realize before that our smell, sense of smell, accounts for 50% of what we taste. They're all connected. I also showed that in humans, this little nerve, it's called olfactory nerve, is connected to various structures in the brain that are important in memory, emotional expression, and behavior. So that after we published a series of papers on this, we were invited by Good Morning America, all the TV shows in the United States, and all kinds of publicity all over the world about this discovery. And in COVID-19, we now know that 15% of patients, 15 to 30%, may present to doctors with no sense of smell. And so this has become very important pathway for viruses to go into the brain. And to your left, this is a patient who died of herpes simplex encephalitis. And herpes simplex encephalitis, the virus, goes through the nose and enter the brain and causes uh, hemorrhage and damage. And frequently, when this occurs, the patient does not recover. What happens to the brain when the virus is able to enter the nervous system? Well, the brain becomes infected by the virus. And this is how it looks. It looks swollen. And there's blood in here. There's hemorrhage. And there's just no way for this unfortunate patient to survive. We now have proven that the coronavirus 2 can be found in the brain and in the fluid inside this cavity called the ventricle. And this fluid, which is called cerebrospinal fluid, can contain the virus and help the virus spread all over the nervous system. Then you have what is called hypoxia. We talked about this and the swollen brain, and what happens when the lungs fail. Then, recently, we are now seeing more strokes in patients with COVID-19. And why it is? Why is it that we have more strokes in COVID-19? This is what happens. In COVID-19, the virus can cause three ways of damage to the nerve, to blood vessels, and to the blood. Some patients, the blood elements do not allow the blood to clot, so it will bleed all over. And look at this to your right. This is bleeding in the brain. 
okay? Then the virus can attack blood vessels, and the blood vessels swell up. They're no longer tight. They open up. And so there is inflammation, swelling, and then the virus just infects the brain and uh, can have fatal consequences. Now, another thing that we found out is that in the brain, of in, in, in the brain, you can see that these blood vessels here are normal, allowing for your left, delivering normal blood to the brain. But on the right side, you can see this blood vessel, tiny blood vessels that, uh, looked, that look like a string. As a matter of fact, in radiology, we call it the string sign because the blood vessels are inflamed and they're closed in some segments so the blood stops them. And look to your left, you have all kinds of strokes, you have blood, and uh, the indicated by arrows causing multiple hemorrhages in the brain in COVID-19. The nerves are not immune either to damage. The nerves are, are, are in the brain and in the peripheral nerve, the arms and legs and throughout the body. We now have evidence that COVID-19 would cause what we call demyelination. What does it mean? The nerve is covered by a sort of a fat uh, uh, layer that we call myelin sheet. Now, in certain infections, the immune system targets the myelin sheet and makes the nerve uh, new and exposed to all kinds of elements. What happens? This is what we see in MS. Very similar picture of MS. So we have now seen what we call um, uh, encephalomyelitis, an MS-like picture in COVID-19. The nerves in our extremities are not uh, immune either. Again, the myelin sheet is attacked, and what happens? The nerves are not protected, and patients get paralyzed. And so we try to give them uh, uh, medications to limit the effects of, uh, uh, or, or to improve the immune status of our patients and limit the damage of the immune reaction due to infection. So how does the brain enter the brain cell. This is again the virus on top and you have the receptor called angiotensin converting enzyme 2. And this is present in the brain, the heart, the liver, the lungs. And so what happens is that the, the, uh, the, the virus uh, occupies that receptor. And once they uh, get together, and it fits into that receptor, you cannot remove them anymore. So the virus enters the brain cell or the lung cell and kills those cells and reproduces. And that's why this is a very important observation as we develop new treatments. All right? And so uh, now, this is a major discovery. And thanks to the human genome, and the human genome is a major project of the world, but uh, funded mostly by our National Institute of Health and the Department of Energy of the United States, with contributions from the United Kingdom, uh, Japan, France, and Germany and China. So it allows us now, within a very short period of time, look at the molecular structures of proteins and the genetic aspect of diseases. And, and so why do some people get really sick while others get mild symptoms or no symptoms at all? This, the immune system uh, has to be competent, but they have to have a limited reaction. If it goes into overdrive, then we can have more problems. The general medical staffs, are we healthy? 
risk factor, and I'll go over this a little bit more, and genetic. And these are the risk factors here. Advancing age, after age 65, there's no question that most of us, in most of us, uh, the, uh, the immune system weakens. Patients who have uh, chronic lung disease and asthma are at a risk. Diabetes is a major risk factor. Heart disease, hypertension, smoking, and blood type A. In addition, obesity and genetics are important risk factors. Now, with these new findings, give us opportunity to develop new treatments. We know now, I mentioned to you, that with the knowledge on cytokine storm, we are unable to use steroids and help some of them recover. We're working on this, the ACE2 inhibitors, how to inhibit the interaction between the receptors and the virus. This is a major issue because vaccines, that is the ultimate uh, uh, goal, is to increase the amount of antibodies in our patients to combat the infection. The, the major questions about this, one is how, many, how much antibodies are produced by this vaccine? How much? How long will they be able to uh, provide the right amount of uh, antibodies? And how effective are these antibodies? So there are still some major issues that we need to iron out before a vaccine can be endorsed. And lastly, I am really concerned about the long-term neurologic complications of COVID-19. What do I mean by that? We need to learn about medical history. The, the worst pandemic before COVID-19 was the influenza, the flu epidemic in 1918. Nobody knows how it started, but everybody now calls it, or most people call it, the Spanish flu. But did you know that one of the major theories on where it started was in Haskell, Kansas, where three servicemen died of the flu, and 18 servicemen developed the symptoms of the flu. So it really didn't start. Nobody could prove it started in Spain, but we call it the Spanish flu. So don't tell me, or I would say that I'm really concerned that when we, uh, we succeed in uh, uh, treating patients with COVID-19, we forget about them. What happens? After the flu epidemic in 1918, there was a surge in the number of Parkinson's disease in the United States. There was a surge in psychosis that needed psychiatric care. So I think we need to be aware that when the brain and the nervous system as a whole are damaged, that there could be some consequences later on in life. Could our patients develop more Alzheimer's disease? Could they develop more Parkinson's disease? How about being in the intensive care for weeks without talking to a friend or relative? Will they be depressed later on? Will they have behavioral symptoms, anxiety, panic attack? We are now have patients who have seizures. How about if the nerves are involved, they get paralyzed? Being in the intensive care for days without any movement can paralyze patients. So their physical activity can be seriously affected in the future. 
this, ladies and gentlemen, we have to be aware of. If we're going really to treat the neurologic complications of COVID-19 effectively, then there is the phenomenon of reactivation. We need to be prepared to give treatment, effective treatment, when the virus is reactivated. Like in chicken pox, the virus that causes chicken pox is the same virus that causes, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, what we call herpes zoster, the shingles, the same virus. They don't go away. They just is, uh, stay dormant in parts of the nervous system. And when the immune system weakens, they, they recur. Same system, the same virus. So they, they are, there are latent effects of certain viruses that we need to be aware of. I hope that we will remain very the best allies in Asia, the United States, and the Philippines. Salamat po. All right, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Um, Reyes, uh, for that uh, wonderful and very informative presentation. Now we go to the question and answer uh, section of the forum. Um, now let me ask the uh, organizer if they have questions. Marie, uh, do you have a question? Yes, I do, Dr. Rivera. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Patricia Reyes, for the very informative presentation. My question is, what proportion of neurologic uh, and psychiatric complications affect the central nervous system versus the peripheral nervous system? Oh, the, uh, we don't know the exact data, Dr. Marlet, or, or but uh, we know that we are monitoring them very carefully. Remember, this is happening, it's still happening right now. So initially, we didn't even care about the nervous system. Now, we have uh, increased the awareness. And so, uh, most of the time, I would have to say that the majority have central nervous system. But we cannot ignore the effect on the peripheral nervous system. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Uh, Emerson, uh, Ia, do you have a question? Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Reyes, for that informative presentation and by really making a case of the connection between COVID-19 and uh, brain. So my question is about the risk factors that relate to the brain. So are there any conditions that you know of uh, that really predispose neurologically? predispose someone to um, getting COVID-19. Yeah, anybody whose immune system is compromised, like patients who have cancer are being treated with chemotherapy, the patients with MS, it's an immunologic disorder, for instance, patients with uh, 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 neuromuscular disorders, uh, uh, myasthenia gravis, uh, patients with have problems with blood elements due to an immune problem. So uh, <clears throat> diabetes uh, in patients with diabetes, the immune system is depressed. So we have to uh, be very careful in, in, in monitoring those patients um, because they have a much higher risk for increased susceptibility to COVID-19. Right, thank you. Um, uh, how about Laura, Dr. Laura, do you have a question? Yes, I do. And um, I echo uh, Dr. Uh, Marie Ortelis and Dr. Ia uh, with their um, appreciation of your uh, presentation, Dr. Reyes. My question is about the smell and memory and the olfactory. Ah. <laughs> and so I would you then say that there are research on on like when you chew gum while studying, then you will have a better memory or when you put on your best perfume while you're studying and you wear that during exams, would that really uh, um, make them remember their, what they've studied? Because this is what I... <laughs> I uh, my job was to, uh, to prove that it is uh, it affected in, in certain diseases. 
But what, whether perfume, what happens was we published our data. It's a series of papers about the smell and the nervous system. You know, uh, some companies uh, produce uh, pheromones. Everybody knows pheromones. And so they, they, we were asked, I was asked to be an advisor to the Chemical Society of the United States, perfume industry, the fuel industry, even the oil industry came to me because there are problems with, uh, they suspect there are problems with the brain because they have to smell the gas, they're exposed to gas and oil. Whether those perfumes really, or <laughs> uh, the scents we call, uh, in, improve brain function, I really don't know. Uh, it could also damage the nerve, but uh, I, uh, as somebody has to do that, uh, that'd be an excellent idea. Perhaps our, one of our medical students can uh, pursue that. All right. It looks like uh, we have questions from the chat box. Uh, Dr. Emerson, would you like to entertain one of the questions? Yes, uh, I'd like to call on Dr. Thelma Reyes. She has a question to you, Dr. Uh, Patricia Reyes. Uh, thank you so Hi. much, Dr. Uh, Pat Reyes, for such a, uh, an outstanding uh, educational lecture. We have a neuroscientist in our midst. Uh, my question is, uh, I know that you're one of the first pioneers to discover the sense of smell in uh, uh, Alzheimer's and other brain diseases, and that you have written the anatomy of the olfactory nerve in medical journals. So my question is, how does the uh, our sense of smell get involved in COVID-19, knowing that, you know, people who are sick with uh, COVID-19, they complain of anosmia or loss of smell okay yes. thank you so much uh, thank you uh, th uh, thank you for that question uh, what happens I, I i believe is that the virus enters the olfactory nerve which is uh hanging in our nose and those little nerves carry the virus into the brain and unfortunately that nerve is the one that allows us to smell and when it enters the brain, it's connected to the brain. And it connects with different parts of the brain that, and ultimately into the center for taste. And the nerve that allows us to taste is connected to our sense, uh, to the nerve that allows us to uh, smell. So then you have two types of symptoms. One is anosmia, meaning there's no sense of smell, or eusia, which is lack of taste. And these are important symptoms because many times uh, ordinary physicians may not understand why or may ignore this. I even have a wives of my patient tell me, I don't like my husband because now he doesn't eat what I prepare for him. He used to eat all the food that I prepare for him. Now he just ignores them. So he doesn't like me anymore in my cooking. So this can cause some marital issues. The, the other thing that we, um, I thought the implication of what we did was we ignored the sense of the smell for centuries in man. We never studied, even in the textbook of medicine, I happened to uh, have one of the authors of our textbook in anatomy in, 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 the, in, the, in medical school, I happened to he happened to be my one of my mentors, and I asked him, "Why is it there is no you, you didn't write anything in the olfactory system?" And he told me it's not important. But I'll tell you, you cannot be a chef if you cannot smell right. All right, you cannot be a chemist for pharmaceutical companies and perfumery if you don't smell right. We even have used the sense of smell in bioterrorism. That's why you have dogs in airport who can smell. That is your sense of smell being used in bioterrorism. So 
there are many instances that the sense of the smell uh, uh, plays an important role in daily life. You, if, if you do not have this sense of the smell, you, you may eat uh, rotten food, for instance, all right? So uh, it is, if you, can, if you do not have a sense of the smell, you cannot be a fireman. You cannot smell a leaking gas. So um, uh, we, we take for granted the sensation, but it's very important. All right, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, there, um, on the um, uh, consulate's Facebook page, there's a comment. Uh, it's not a question, but a comment uh, from Maria T. Thank you, Dr. Reyes. Your talk has been most informative and comprehensive over overview of COVID I have seen or watched. Well, thank you for that comment. Um, and there's also another comment on the, uh, there's a question uh, on the chat box, but uh, let me just read to you another comment here. Janet Huai Kong, I think she was one of the uh, frontliners uh, that we had featured uh, in one of the forum. Uh, she said, thank you very much for the information. You just validated what we know now. I'm seeing a lot of patients in my unit. Uh, it's a rehab unit with stroke and this patient recovered from COVID-19. It looks like they have uh, patients there that recovered from COVID-19 and having strokes. All right, uh, I think there's a question, um, uh, Emerson in the chat box, another question there. Yes, we have two, but I'm gonna go to the first one. I hope we have time for the second one, but uh -huh. the question is uh, about Alzheimer's disease. So are patients with Alzheimer's disease are at higher risk then of getting COVID, give it olfactory route of transmission, or are they immune because of the olfactory dysfunction? I don't think Alzheimer's disease affects the immune system. We merely show that the olfactory system is damaged in, the, uh, in, in Alzheimer's disease patients. And again, that can affect nutrition. If you have patients with Alzheimer's disease, many of them will only like to eat sweet, sugary food. And that's what uh, caught my attention in one of my patients. But in, with regard to immune system, the relationship with uh, Alzheimer's disease and the immune system, uh, we don't know what the relationship, whether the biofilm or whatever. All right, um, thank you. Uh, there's a question on the Facebook page, uh, question. Not sure if this was addressed. After intubation, can a patient who lost the sense of taste recover? Uh, what's the average time for recovery? Well, uh, this is a new discovery in terms of symptoms and we are uh, trying to understand uh, uh, recovery on this space. First of all, it's very hard to, uh, to test taste. And it's, that's why we started, uh, although my patient was uh, eating too much chocolate, uh, it was very difficult scientifically to test taste because they, they, all the, the receptors and the, 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 uh, the uh, taste are all mixed up, but in the smell, you can identify or distinguish one from the other. So it's a very good question, but very difficult to address. I think we have to play uh, with time and just uh, tell them, uh, for instance, what they prefer to eat and whether uh, their diet changes because of their taste preference. But I think it's important to Test their smell as well because they are related. Your taste may be bad because of your sense of smell. That's why in individuals who have the flu or running nose or cold, you don't taste right because your sense of smell is not working. Remember, you don't want to eat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you. Uh, that question was from Carol. Carol Tanchuko. Um, 
There's one more question on the chat box uh, from from Jean. Uh, do you want to read that, uh, Emerson? The question is, what medication alleviates demyelination? Demyelination, and what is why this is not a treatment for, um, I guess, multiple sclerosis or MS? Well, we we actually uh, use uh, the same the uh, the um, excuse me the uh, components of the uh, the myelin sheath may be different in terms of quantity and uh, 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 and composition between the myelin sheath in the brain and the peripheral nerve. And in the uh, peripheral nerve, there is a uh, 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 so systemic uh, problem that you can identify. Like if you um, look at antibodies in the serum, in the blood, and you can identify them if there is Guillain-Barre or in the CSF, it's kind of fluid. In MS, we you, you, you don't develop this type of antibody, the different antibody. And so uh, uh, <clears throat> the treatment is completely um, different. But in some cases, we have used the same uh, uh, immunologic treatment for peripheral uh, uh, nerve uh, uh, for MS patients in some cases. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Um, Patricio Reyes. Uh, again, um, our um, much gratitude to you, and uh, hopefully um, we would see you again in the next series, maybe in person, so we can, <laughs> <laughs> so we can actually meet you in person. Um, so again, thank you, and um, uh, Hopefully, um, you know, there'll be more things that would come up in the next few okay. months, and okay. then you can present that at a later date. Um, okay. Thank You're you. welcome. It's an honor and it's a pleasure. Yes. Okay. Um, before we go, we ne we now have before we finalize the program, we have uh, some uh, remarks from the Consul General before we finalize. Um, Ambassador. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Uh, Romel. Once again, this forum proves that uh, we are so blessed in our community to be very, very much in the middle of uh, efforts to understand, to mitigate, to find solutions to the problems we face because of the pandemic. Uh, our dear friend who was a guest with us uh, previously at uh, the NIA, the National Institutes for Allergy and Infectious Diseases, who is very much uh, engaged in the development of the vaccine, is uh, now even uh, helping us, Dr. Arce, uh, to, to make connections with uh, Moderna for uh, possible uh, uh, cooperation. And today, we have Dr. Uh, Reyes uh, showing us that our Filipino medical practitioners are very much in the front lines of understanding and uh, possibly developing uh, the, the, uh, the correct, the effective responses, medical responses to the pandemic. So, uh, you know, I am so very proud and uh, we thank you so much, uh, Dr. Reyes. And uh, I do look forward to, to you, uh, our dear partners, continuing this very important undertaking, making our community a source of uh, very useful information, as well as, uh, 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 venue for cooperation with the rest of the uh, Filipino American community and the this uh, great country as well. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, Ambassador. 
And now we have Marie to announce uh, next health forum, which we haven't planned yet, Marie. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Rivera. Thank you, Dr. Patricia Reyes, for a very enlightening lecture. And thank you, uh, Conjen, Cristobal, and my co-organizers. And to all our viewers, please stay tuned because we will have more for you in the succeeding forums and the topic will have to be determined. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Marie. And now, uh, Laura, for some closing remarks. Thank you all for joining our 10th PhilAm Health Forum. Got feedback? We would love to hear from you. Please send us your comments feedback, or suggestions on how we can improve our forum. Most importantly, just let us know um, future topics that you would like to hear and email us at phil.am.health.forum at gmail.com and follow us at hashtag philamhealthcovid19. Thank you and see you next time. Be well and be safe. All right, well, that ends our program. Thank you all. Maraming salamat. Uh, hopefully to see you again on the next uh, forum. Bye-bye now. Stay right. safe, stay healthy. Maraming salamat.